come now is the time to worship come now is the time to give you My mic isn't live, is it, Rick? Um, we're here at Crossroads this morning. Although we had a little bit of a technical glitch, but uh, we recovered. Uh, it's good to have you with us. Um, just a reminder to those elders who are listening, please uh, go to the um, website where... Uh, all the documents are for the session meeting, and we will be uh, having hold, holding a meeting on Zoom. Uh, please send me an email uh, if you are not able to um, be a part of that meeting. I don't know of any other announcements. Uh, things are as is, uh, we are um, financially, uh, we're surviving, and but we'd appreciate it if you are uh, able to uh, uh, send in your uh, contributions, uh, and Natalie will be able to deposit them and post them. So let us prepare our hearts to worship God. The psalmist writes, Praise our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He has, reserved, he has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. Let us take heed of the psalmist and praise the Lord on this spring day for all the beauty that are, surrounds us as we sing for the beauty of the earth. Oh, oh, oh. 
Let us pray. Great and wonderful God, we see flowers blooming. We hear birds in the air making their nests, preparing to receive their young. We see how you provide in all of nature, how you have provided for us. We thank you. We give you praise and honor that in your constant love for us, you plan our lives, you provide for our needs, and most importantly, you have sent your son to live and die and be raised to new life for that resurrection, we lift up our hearts in joyful praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us continue our worship this morning by singing. I've forgotten. I chose the song, Holy is Our God. Casting down the golden clouds. 
crowns around the blessings. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, through earth and earth and heaven worship thee. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all the works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. call to confession comes from the Psalms. The psalmist writes, come and listen to all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him in my, with my mouth and his praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, he would not have heard me. If we harbor sin, if we hold on to those things that we know are wrong, those attitudes we know we need to let go of, they create a block in God. We need to release them. We need to confess them. We need to look squarely upon them and acknowledge them for what they are. Sinful attitudes, sinful actions. Only then... Will God listen and hear us? Therefore, let us come before him with our song of confession and prepare to confess our sins to him. In the book of First John, John writes to a church and says, God is faithful, God is just, to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory, Glory to, to God, God in the Christ. highest.
Let us pray. God, our helper, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may be led into your truth and taught your will for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This morning's gospel reading comes to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 15 through 21. Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. They said, we would like to see Jesus. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you, O Christ. During this time of quarantine, without face-to-face -face meetings, we've been doing pretty good. Um, Karen has been picking up the, uh, the slack. She's responding to emails very quite well. I even send them out. But this week, something happened. I have no idea what, and I didn't notice it. You know, she's been doing, we've been having such good communications that you just don't take time to, uh, to look things over like you should. And I didn't see the scripture passage until just, until Josh started reading it. And it was not the one that I spent 18 hours preparing. So I'm going to read the one that I spent time preparing. Somewhere in my files, I have one on the passage that was printed. But in John chapter 14, verses 15 through 21, read, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. 
I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in the Father and the Father in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father. And I will love them and reveal myself to them. One of my favorite movies is Fiddler on the Roof. It really captures the milieu of the Jewish community. I love all the songs in it. If I had to choose which ones is, is my favorite, it, it would be almost impossible. Uh, the, the opening scene with everybody dancing with the Fiddler on the Roof and Tevier saying, singing tradition is just an amazing uh, description of what held the Jewish community together through persecution, through exile, through conquest, through um, all sorts of suffering. They held on to the traditions and they kept them, themselves together. There's also the song, Sunrise, Sunset, which describes the Sabbath. Someone once wrote that, uh, the, that this, it was the Sabbath, the celebration of the Sabbath, which was a tradition uh, that really uh, kept the Jewish community together and uh, unbreakable during all of their uh, time of persecution. In the movie, it is such a, a somber moment, and uh, it's so beautiful. Who can ever forget Tevier singing, If I Were a Rich Man? He humorously captures that desire of all of us to have so much wealth that we don't have to work again, that we can just... <coughs> sit around and talk about the scriptures with the learned of the community. And there's, then there's that song, Miracle of Miracles, when Mo, Moto uh, realizes that he's going to be able to marry Zidal, uh, Tevye's oldest daughter, and uh, it's, it's an answer to his prayer. And it just... It, the joy that just bounds in his life and the way they dance around through the fields, it's just wonderful. One of the, the really enduring songs, um, beautiful song that, I, that I stands out for me is when Tevier asks his wife, Goldie, do you love me? Love is kind of a new concept for Tevye. He, it's based on, <coughs> the song is based on uh, Moro and Zaito's love for one another. It's the reason they want to be married. It's the reason that Zaito wants to marry Moro, not um, the butcher who um, Tevye first pledged her uh, in marriage. And now Tevye wants to know if his wife, Goldie, truly loves him. Goldie is stunned by this. She thinks, your daughter's getting married. There is trouble in the town. You're upset. Go inside. Go lie down. Maybe it's indigestion. Tevier is undaunted. He says, he sings, do you love me? And she yells, 
do I love you? For 25 years, I've washed your clothes, cooked, cleaned your house, given you children, milked the cow in 25 years. Why talk about love now? But then they come to that conclusion at the end when they both sit down on the bed and it's such a tender moment when they acknowledge that they love one another. Jesus would appreciate that song because for him, love was not a, an ethereal feeling. Love was not chills that went up and down your spine when you saw another person or when you touched their hand. Love was an action word. Love had to be expressed in deeds, not just um, feelings. The feelings would come with the deeds when the deeds are done. And the deeds that he wanted his disciples to do was to obey his commands. This raises the question, which, command, which commandment does Jesus want us to obey? If we look at the Old Testament, there are 615 commands in the Old Testament, but Jesus kind of ignores all those. And he focuses on one for his disciples. In John chapter 13, and I think that this is the commandment that Jesus had in mind because John 13 has a flow that leads into John 14. Jesus says, this is how all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. This is the new commandment that Jesus gives. Excuse me a moment. You know, those words, those words are so simple to understand. Even a, a small child can understand them. It's the whole idea. When you think of another person, share your toys, be kind. Don't, don't throw things at them. But yet, those words have all also baffled the brightest theologians down through the history of the church, trying to understand their significance and their meaning. Those words also bring conviction on my heart. I can think of many times when I failed to live up to those words. Where I've done things, said things, didn't do things, that I should have done, that I shouldn't have done. We all fall short of those words. We fall short because they require us to switch our focus. We as human beings, as a consequence of the fall, are self-centered, self-absorbed, basically selfish people. The whole world revolves around us. We think that everyone should revolve around us. Now, if we live that out, <clears throat> that creates problems. You can't have several billion people all thinking that they are the center of the universe. It just kind of creates problems. Somehow we have to reorient our focus. We have to change it from just seeing ourselves, just seeing our own needs, just focusing on what is important in our lives to looking at the needs of others to looking at the needs within the church. You 
Jesus also, though, wants us to take it to its extreme. You see, it's easy to pretend we love each other. It's easy to make a casserole. It's easy to send a birthday card. It's easy even to make a telephone call. Now, I'm not, I'm not knocking those things. Those are all good steps, especially in a time of quarantine, sending birthday cards, send, uh, posting on Facebook, happy birthday, um, telling people that you appreciate their work, are all important, especially now, since we can't be in touch with, in connection with each other. But those are just first steps. Those are just kind of baby steps that we need to take. There, Jesus expects much more. Jesus wants us to genuinely express an interest in another person. He doesn't want us to fake it. He doesn't want us to go through the motions. He does not want our, our love to be superficial. Bringing a dessert to pot, a potluck, writing a check to help pay the, the bills, keep the lights on, keep the place heated, are all important. They're helpful. But he wants us to do more. I wonder, I wonder how many of us are shedding tears for those people who are suffering from the COVID-19 uh, virus. Have you shed any tears? Or at least have you expressed sorrow in your heart for the 300,000 people who have died in the world. As far as I know, we haven't had anybody within our own church suffer from it. Maybe a light case here or there. Well, yeah, I guess there is one person who has, and she has miraculously been healed and has returned to the uh, a nursing home. I forgot about that person. I was writing the sermon. But... I wonder, do we really feel bad for one another when we see the other person sick or injured or going through chemotherapy? Can we empathize at that deep level? We can sing about amazing grace. We can cast our cares upon God. But until our we can actually shed tears or at least have sorrow in our heart. All of our, quote, love is superficial. That takes a tremendous amount of effort. That takes a decision that we are going to be involved in each other's lives. We're going to get to know them. It'll, it's a two-way street. We have to be involved with their lives and they have to be open to letting us be involved. Uh, there are some stumbling blocks in, 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 in that part of it, but we must make the effort. Someone once wrote, um, Francis... Um, wasn't Francis of Assisi. Um, I didn't write it down. I, I've forgotten the quote, or I've forgotten the person. But they said, think of, think of each other as more important than yourself. The way to begin to truly love each other is to realize that for us, that other person or those other people are more important than us. C.S. Lewis write, wrote a marvelous little book called The Screwtape Letters. They're letters from one tempter 
to another. Screwtape is writing to Wormwood because Wormwood is his disciple and he's trying to instruct Wormwood on how to bring this one responsibility, this one man down and so that he would um, not become a Christian and or live his life in such a way that he would um, enter into the lower kingdom. And it's rather humorous. In the second letter, um, Screwtape says, let him go to church, but let him see people for who they are. So when he gets to his pew, have him look around and see just the selection of neighbors that he's been avoiding. You want to lean pretty heavily on those neighbors. It's the idea that when we gather together as a church body, we have many different people. And more than likely, we're going to have some people that really annoy us, either their personality or their lifestyle or their political views or something. Um, C.S. Lewis makes it even minor than that. He writes later, uh, Screwtape says, any of those neighbors who can sing out of tune or have boots that squeak, or double chins, or odd clothes, the patient will quite easily believe that their religion must be somehow be ridiculous. It's the whole idea that, okay, let them be other-focused, but let them see all the quirks, all the idiosyncrasies. I remember a man... He was in the church that I was I grew up in. He was the worst singer I have ever heard. Oliver couldn't carry a tune if his life depended on him. Maybe after four verses of a hymn, Oliver hit 10% of the notes. And even those that he hit had a had a terrible sound to them. And you know what? Oliver knew it, and he didn't care. He was going to sing as loudly as he could because he loved the tunes. Now, if, you, if the people in the church would have focused on Oliver, I don't think anybody would have attended our church grow, growing up. I mean, as it was, no one could sit three pews in front of him because you just couldn't stand the, the sound that was coming from behind. But if you let that singing get to you, then you miss the person. Oliver was a pretty great man. He not only was a Sunday school teacher, he taught my sixth grade class, seventh grade class. His wife taught my sixth grade class. But he also served the state of or the, uh, the University of Akron as a um, uh, teacher, taught political science. And he also served the state of Ohio. For six years, Oliver was the president of the Ohio Senate. And so Oliver could provide a great deal of wisdom, a great deal of, of, of knowledge. He was a he was a storehouse of information that was just waiting to be tapped, waiting to be shared. But you let, but so oftentimes the one thing that you remembered about Oliver was his singing. And that's what Satan, you know, Lewis is trying to say, that's what Satan uses. He uses those little idiosyncrasies to get to us, to put us off to one another, to kind of detract us. Now, at this point, I'm 
so glad that the lectionary did not stop at verse 15, other than the fact that it would have been a very short lectionary to only have one verse, but it also would have really been difficult. It would have left me in a bind because here it was, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. Now I know I don't obey all of Jesus' commandments. I don't love everyone like he loved me, like he loves me. So does that mean I don't love Jesus? How do I do it on my own? I know I'm going to fall short. I know I'm not going to live a life of perfection. I think Jesus understood that. I think he recognized that that would happen. And so he goes on and he says that he will send another, another person who will come. In our scripture passage, he's called a counselor. In the song we sung about holy is our God, he's called a comforter. He goes, the Holy Spirit goes by all those names, comforter, counselor, advocate. The reason is, is it's a difficult trans, it's a difficult word to translate, paraclete. There's no one for one um, translation of that particular word because it's a combination of two words. What it really means is someone who comes alongside you. That's too long for the translators. They want to capture that in one word. But that's what the paraclete does. That's what the Holy Spirit is. He's someone who comes alongside, someone who is there, someone who fills us with God's love, God's grace, and most importantly, God's power to live out the commandments. We are not alone. The paraclete is with us. The Holy Spirit is there standing next to us to fill us with God's love, God's grace, and God's presence. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. The Holy Spirit comes from the Father and makes that all possible. We love Jesus by loving one another. Someone once wrote, the love we are commanded to share is the love we are endlessly given. Think about that. The love we are commanded to share is the love that we are endlessly given. God knows that we can love one another through all of our idiosyncrasies, through all of our inconsistencies, because his love just keeps flowing down into our lives, into our imperfect lives, so that we can share that with one another. If we love Jesus, we will obey his commandments and the new commandment is to love one another as Jesus loves us. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you that you are with us, filling us with your love and your grace. We thank you that you do not leave us alone that you empower us to go out into the world to serve, that you empower us to love the people that you give to us in this church. May that spirit of love reign in our lives. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let us pray. Oh God, we bring before you this day all the cares and concerns, joys and sorrows that lay on our hearts. In this time of quarantine, we give thanks for the technology that allows us to come together in spirit that allows us to attend Sunday school virtually together. We give you thanks for this gathering here in this room and for all those tuning in this morning. We give you thanks for the rain that is watering our gardens and greening our grass. We give you thanks for all our loved ones, friends, and family. May we feel more connected to them and not less connected. May we share that love that Jesus so freely shares with us, with our friends and family and those we have yet to meet. We pray especially this day for all those who are hurting or sick or in pain. We pray for MJ as she continues to recover in the nursing home. We pray for Melva who's experiencing extreme pain. We pray for Bill, her husband, as they care for one another. We pray for Pam and Sue as they care for their parents. We pray for Kathy as she looks towards her surgery on Monday. We pray that the doctor's hand, that the doctor's hands be guided that the stent be properly placed and that the surgery is a success. For all those prayers, named and unnamed, we lift them to you, O Lord. Give us the grace to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. With the confidence of the people of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God for all the things that he has given and all the blessings that we have received.
And now, go into the world, love and serve God and one another. And as you go, go knowing that the Holy Spirit, God the Father, and God the Son, go with you now and forevermore. Amen. I live, I live, because he is risen. I live, I live, to worship him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Because you're alive. Because you're alive.